He's the Oracle of Omaha, the Wizard of Wall Street, and one of the greatest investors of all time, turning Berkshire Hathaway into the giant that it is today. The business which he runs with Charlie Munger has gone from $480 a share in 1982 to $415,850 today, making that an 86,535% return in 40 years. To put it simply, if you'd invested just $1,200 and never invested a single penny more, you'd now be sitting on over a million dollars. But unless you've got a time machine and currently have a TARDIS we can use, the next best thing we can do as mere mortals is learn from some of the tips that Buffett kindly outlines in his annual shareholder letters. You see, I'm sure you might have heard of these, they've got quite the following and they're open to everyone to see, and I've spent the past few days going through as many as I can to get some of the best tips for all of you. Sit back, relax, and take in the wisdom. Here's 10 of his most valuable tips to investors in no particular order. Let's go. Try and figure out what you find admirable and then decide, you know, that the person you really would like to admire is yourself. And the only way you're going to do it is take on the qualities of other people you admire. Up first, this one's probably most relevant to what we're currently going through in the stock market at the moment with everyone panicking, lots of people selling and many people expecting recession. Buffett says, ignore the market prices day to day. All of this is just noise. This comes from the 1987 letter and he reminds us of his old mentor and friend, Benjamin Graham, widely considered to be the father of the whole value investing concept. The story says that you imagine someone called Mr. Market coming to you every single day, giving you a price for your stocks. And it goes on to say, even though the business that the two of you own may have economic characteristics that are stable, Mr. Market's quotations will be anything but. For, sad to say, the poor fellow has incurable emotional problems. At times he feels euphoric and can only see the favourable factors affecting the business, when in that mood he names a very high buy-sell price because he fears that you'll snap up his interest and rob him of imminent gains. At other times he's depressed and you can see nothing but trouble ahead for both the business and the world. On these occasions, he'll name a very low price since he's terrified that you'll unload your interest on him. In the rest of the letter, Buffett says that we should really just ignore Mr. Market and remind ourselves that he's there to serve us. And if we want to listen, then that's fine, but we shouldn't react to his crazy nature. Finally, he adds that Charlie and I let our marketable equities tell us by their operating results, not by their daily or even yearly price quotations, whether our investments are successful. The market may ignore business success for a while, but eventually will confirm it. Leading us nicely from this point about market prices in point number two, when you're looking to buy company stock, don't buy it because it looks cheap. At the moment, you're seeing lots of stocks who are way down at the cheapest they've ever been according to their current share prices. Some are down 50, 60, or even 80% down from their highs that we saw last year. As a reminder, none of this is new. There's been plenty of times in history where stocks have dropped in price for multiple reasons during downturns in the economy. Don't worry, even Warren himself isn't immune from doing this, but he learned pretty early on in his career not to just buy cheap for the sake of it. Here's his lesson from 1985. Buffett bought out a company called Warmbeck Mills, a textiles maker in the US, and slowly realized that no matter what the company could do, there was no way back to the industry. Although he might have snapped out for a good price, the wider market and the business model in general were doomed to fail, brought on from mainly foreign produced goods. There was basically no way to compete. He goes on to conclude that the situation is suggestive of Samuel Johnson's horse. A horse that can count to 10 is a remarkable horse, not a remarkable mathematician. Likewise, a textile company that allocates capital brilliantly within an industry is a remarkable textile company, but not a remarkable business. In short, the company might be doing its best, but if the wider industry isn't going anywhere, then you're pretty much ruined. That's probably how you would have felt investing in companies like Blockbuster Video or even Kodak. Eventually, they look really cheap, but they're cheap for a reason. Avoid. Up next, a timeless reminder to all of us, stop trading so much. All of the data out there supports this, yet we're always so keen to make the next trade or buy the next hot stock. Page 17, 2005. The story about a fictional family called the Got Rocks. They own all of the stocks, every single one equally. And all of a sudden, some smart talking advisors come along who Buffett calls helpers. The helpers persuade them to start turning on one another, trying to buy and sell at different times to enrich themselves more than their other family members. The point here is that over time, the family actually got poorer overall because the helpers take their commissions and fees every time they trade. In total, the whole market might grow 10% in a year as business improves its profits but once you take into account the fees and commissions that you actually start to receive, less and less of the amount actually comes back to you. The story snowballs, more and more of these helpers come on board and even the helpers get managers adding onto the fees that the family experiences. If you hadn't realized it, the helpers in this example are all of the hedge funds, money managers, and the whole marketing machine from Wall Street that wants you to trade actively. More trades means more money for them regardless of whether the market's going up or down. They win no matter what and you're left holding the bags. 
Now, for those of you who do like to pick some individual stocks, you'll love this advice. It's about as simple as it gets, and Buffett mentioned these points in so many of his letters. Here are the four points and one key factor him and Charlie look for. Page five, 2007 annual report. Here's what they look for. A, a business we can understand. B, favorable long-term economics. C, able and trustworthy management. And D, a sensible price tag. Oh, and don't forget one of the most important points in the next paragraph along. A truly great business must have an enduring moat. That's the thing that makes it safe from competition. All of these points sound really simple, but of course, in reality, it takes a lot of work to find a business that meets all of these points. Some great examples sit in the Berkshire Hathaway company though, like Coca-Cola, Costco, and American Express. All of these businesses have been around for a long time, make a lot of money, but most importantly, they're extremely difficult to beat if you wanna start a new business today. Take Coca-Cola for example. You've got every supermarket in the world making their own brand cola for a fraction of the price, but people keep coming back to the brand time and time again. By the way, in case you didn't know this, Buffett loves the stuff so much that apparently he drinks five cans a day, and that is definitely not a recommendation for anyone. You'd have no teeth left. Funny story, I just found out that he actually used to drink Pepsi, and he was persuaded to drink Coca-Cola by the guy who ended up selling his company to Coca-Cola in 1964 and rising to the ranks to become Coke's president and chief operating officer. Tip number five, think like a business owner. Now this sounds simple, but I think we forget that when we buy a share of a company, we become a part owner. So really we should act like one. Let's go to the 1996 letter. Buffett writes, your goal as an investor should simply be to purchase at a rational price, a part interest in an easily understandable business whose earnings are virtually certain to be materially higher five, 10 and 20 years from now. He then adds, if you aren't willing to own a stock for 10 years, don't even think about owning it for 10 minutes. The bottom line for this tip is that business owners aren't sat there every day looking at the share price. They look at ways to make more money and to grow their business in the long term. In the short term, we know anything can happen. Remember our friend Mr. Market from earlier on in the video? He's always there giving us a price every day. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, but what matters is how good the business is in the long term. If you haven't got the message yet, just ignore Mr. Market. And just before we head to point number six, if you're enjoying the video, please do me a huge favor and hit the like button. It really helps out small channels like mine get to more people like you. And with that done, let's head back to the Oracle of Omaha's next point. Of everything that Buffett wrote in his letters, one of the most common points that is brought up time and time again is one extremely key thing. Buying and holding index funds like the S&P 500 is probably the best thing that small and large investors can do in the long term. Now, a lot of you are thinking, yeah, well, sure, he says that, and then he goes and picks stock, so you should do as he does and not what he says. But on this point, he isn't kidding. 1993, 1996, 2004, 2007, 2016, and many more that I'm too lazy to remember or look for, he says the same thing that most people would do well in index funds. Even his fortune after he passes is already pledged to be invested in it. So I think it's more than just a gesture, this one. Now, for me personally, I don't think that means you can't pick your own stocks. I do think too, though, that it is a reminder that it's a tough business and not everyone has the time or the stomach for this kind of business and that growing a portfolio better than the market over decades is only done by a very small number of investors. This one's quite a specific one, but almost always a good thing. Look for companies who buy back their own shares. What this means is that as a shareholder, you'll start to get a bigger slice of the company over time for doing absolutely nothing. In the 2018 letter on page five, Buffett says that their holdings of American Express have stayed the same over the previous eight years, but their ownership has actually increased from 12.6% to 17.9% purely because of those share buybacks. He goes on to say that of the $6.9 billion earnings that American Express made, 1.2 billion is for Berkshire, and that's almost as much as they paid for their entire stake. So that year's earnings has paid for their entire stake they bought all those years ago. Don't forget too that Berkshire's largest holding is currently Apple, and over the past decade, that company has purchased back almost $500 billion worth of stock. That's such an enormous amount of money that it's actually hard to picture. It's the same as the revenue produced by Amazon in an entire year and almost as much as Walmart too. So look out for these in the news. It's almost always going to be a very good thing for you. Now, if you watch YouTube a lot, you'll know that we love a good thumbnail with flames in it, saying that the market's gonna crash. And also our new favorite at the moment seems to be guessing which direction the Federal Reserve will move interest rates. The truth is that none of this really matters. It might make great TV and a good topic to speculate on, but for us long-term investors, it shouldn't really matter at all. Why don't you hear this from the man himself from this clip from the Berkshire meeting back in 1997. We pay very little attention, we don't pay any attention to uh, capital flows, in other words, we don't really care who's buying or selling any security. Somebody is buying or selling each one. So obviously there's 
you know, you could you could focus on the buyers, you could focus on the sellers, but uh, you can say now that there's 20 billion a month or so going into equity funds and all. But it doesn't make any difference to us. We all we're interested in what the, is what the business is worth and. What people are paying attention to in terms of capital flows or whatever, or market signals or whether the Fed's going to move, that all changes. You remember 10 years ago, it was, you know, it was M2 that every everybody, every whatever day of the week it was, you know, what, what's M2 this week? I always thought of having a mystery, you know, about whatever happened to M2. Or so. <laughs> but yeah. it, it, there's always something that people are talking about. There's so much time to fill with chatter. Funny hearing that in 2022, isn't it? History repeats itself as we get caught up in the short-term macroeconomics. Page 18, 2013. I can't remember what the headlines or pundits were saying at the time. Whatever the chatter, corn would keep growing in Nebraska and students would flock to NYU. Just treat this whole short-term situation as noise, but please do still watch the videos. It takes long time to make these shocked faces and thumbnails. In the point just before last, this should be something we never do, but lots of people still do it regardless of the risks. Never invest with borrowed money. Page 10 in the 2017 report. Buffett gives the example that although Berkshire's grown amazingly well in the long term, anything could happen in the stock market and does happen in any given year. He shows how during four different periods, the market went down from 37% to 59%, even though the overall trend was up. He says, this table offers the strongest argument I could muster against ever using borrowed money to own stocks. So just don't do it, guys. And finally, an old classic saying that I'll remind you of for staying all the way to the end. So thank you so much for that. Be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. This point sounds like one that we all agree on and how many of us would love to go back to April 2020 and buy everything. The issue is that we probably didn't do this because we thought it was all over and that stocks were going to go and crash further. Until you're in a crash and experiencing it, living by this lesson is tough. In the 2009 letter, you can see that Buffett went along with his word and acted in the market crash. Berkshire Hathaway was a big buyer during this time and they were in a great position because they made sure that they had lots of cash and no debt hanging over them. Now that's not to say that we do the same as I don't agree with that necessarily for a personal long-term investor, but we should act if things are on sale. If we can contribute more during a market downturn, we can add to our returns, but don't let that make you become a market timer. As Buffett says himself many, many times, they have no idea what will happen next. Thank you so much for staying until the end. If you did like this video, why not see what Warren Buffett thinks is the single best investment that you can make and why? There may have been a little clue in this video. Anyway, on the way out, please drop me a like if you've enjoyed the video, subscribe for many more, and as always, happy investing.